Before I begin, I want to thank, thank Brother Ken Boy for preaching last Sunday's message in my absence. Also, I'd like to thank Brother Carson for speaking on Sunday evening last week. Looking forward to Brother Jarrett's message on tonight. I'd like to thank Brother Allen for reading our scriptural text this morning, uh, which came from the book of Isaiah. The chapter was 30, and the verses are 8 through 11. Isaiah chapter 30, and the verses are 8 through 11. And it is from that passage of scripture that I would like to draw upon the blackboards of your minds and preach from the subject, the truth is not always a smooth thing. Looking at the text, which helps us to understand the context of Isaiah chapter 30, we see that when the Assyrian Empire, uh, with the Assyrian Empire growing and dominating rapidly, in this text, Judah prepares for the worst. They heard what Assyria did to the Syrians, and they witnessed what happened to their brethren in the north, and their brethren in the north were, were the Israelites, the northern kingdom. Israel. Therefore, Judah believes that their only solution was to trust in another nation, a nation that once enslaved them. Judah, we see in this text, is attempting to put their hopes in an alliance that King Solomon himself made with this nation through his marriage to Pharaoh's daughter. The nation in question is Egypt. Now, according to the mindset of Judah, this move is necessary, but it is only essential because of the sins that they have committed before God and God's judgment on his people. This move that they're attempting to make also adds more sin to their ledger, as if their transgression wasn't enough, as if their iniquity wasn't enough, as if their violation of God's law wasn't enough, they're going to add more to their sin by putting their trust in somebody and something other than God. And so due to their lack of trust in the Lord who can, who can deliver them, we see that their destruction is inevitable. Now, when we look at Isaiah chapter 30, we look at the first seven verses of that chapter and when we read that chapter we see that Jerusalem was guilty of rebellion they trusted Egypt over God they trusted money over God's power now when we look at our scriptural text of Isaiah chapter 30 verses 8 through 11 we see that Jerusalem was not only guilty of rebellion but they were also guilty of rejecting the prophet Jeremiah addresses this same rejection years later. Listen to your Bible. In Jeremiah, the chapter is 6, and the verses are 13 through 15. Jeremiah, the chapter is 6, and the verses are 13 through 15. The prophet writes, For from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. And from prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall at the time that I punish them. They shall be overthrown, says the Lord. Then we go down to Isaiah chapter 30, and the verses are 12 through 17. In that text, we see that Judah is told that decisions have consequences. Jerusalem's wall of protection would suddenly collapse and shatter to pieces like a clay vessel. Their only hope was to not trust in Egypt, not turn to another nation. Their only hope was to repent turn to the Lord, and by faith rest only in God. As we continue to read in Isaiah chapter 30, we come to verses 18 through 26. 
in Jeremiah, I mean Isaiah chapter 30, verses 18 through 26, we see that God intends on restoring because he is gracious and he is merciful, yet punishment is necessary because the same God who is gracious, the same God that is merciful is also a God that is just. God knows that Judah will bring forth fruits meat for repentance, but only after they have feasted on the bread of adversity and drank the water of affliction, which will be in the form of Babylonian captivity. And now we come to the end of chapter 30. When we look at verses 27 through 33, we see in that text that God is also a God of hope because God assures the people through the prophet that their enemies will fall, God will defeat the Assyrians. Now, in this text, we learn that Judah is guilty of at least three sins, and they all had to do with their relationship to the truth. Sin number one, their rejection of truth. Sin number two, their revolution against truth. And sin number three, their rebellion towards truth. And just like we have people rebelling against the truth and rejecting the truth and having a campaign against the truth today, uh, back then, it's the same sin that is taking place today. And so there's just three points that I want to bring to your attention on this morning, and then the lesson is yours to respond to. First, I want to talk about the truth. Then number two, I want to talk about the whole truth. And then number three, I want to talk about nothing but the truth. That's what we're going to talk about this morning, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 18, verse 38. John chapter 18, and the verse is 38. We're going to talk about the truth and answer the question, what is truth? In John chapter 8, verse 38, Pilate said to him, him being Jesus, what is truth? That's the question on this morning. What is truth? This is the question Pilate asked Jesus Prior to Christ's death on Calvary's cross, Pilate was looking for a philosophical answer to the question. He's asking the question, what is real? He's asking the question, what is valid? He's asking the question, what is true or actual state of the matter? Nevertheless, Jesus had already answered this question in the prayer he prayed in the chapter before this one. Listen to your Bible, chapter 17, and the verse is 17. John chapter 17, and the verse is 17. Listen to Jesus' words to the Father. He says to the Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Truth is not found in God's word. Truth is God's word. Therefore, we must accept all God says. For to accept less than all makes us guilty of the sin, of the rejection of truth. So that's the truth. Well, let's talk about now the whole truth. The whole truth we see in, uh, in John chapter 14 and the verse is 6. In John chapter 14 and the verse is 6, we see the six I am statement of Jesus in this book. In John chapter 14, verse 6, the Bible reads, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We learn in this text that truth is more than a what. 
But that truth is a who. Who is truth? So we see in our text of Isaiah chapter 30 that Judah was guilty of choosing Egypt over Jehovah. And so the question we need to ask ourselves this morning is, who are we guilty of choosing over Jesus? See, we learn in this text that Jesus declared himself to be the truth. The apostle John confirms this fact in 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. In 1 John, the chapter is 5, and the verse is 20. The Bible reads, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. We learned that Jesus himself called for a spiritual revolution in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. He did not call for revolution against himself. Yet, my brothers and sisters, we find ourselves guilty of such when we revolt against Jesus by taking the words of a scholar over Jesus, by taking the words of some earthly author over Jesus, by taking the words of some preacher over Jesus, by taking the words of some pastor over Jesus, or even by taking the word of a big name brother over Jesus. My brothers and sisters, Jesus is the only word that matters. He's the only one that matters. We need to choose Jesus over confusion. Jesus over Muhammad. Jesus over Buddha. Jesus over the Pope. Jesus over anybody that we think is a somebody because we are nothing more than nobody just trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody and that somebody is Jesus. And so Jesus is the truth. So we know the truth, the whole truth. Now let's talk about nothing but the truth. Let's hear what Jesus has to say in John chapter 8, verse 32. In John chapter 8, and the verse is 32. Jesus says, John chapter 8, and the verse is 32. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We know what truth is. We know who truth is. Now we need to understand the who and what of truth. So we learn what it means to understand truth. In all the verses that we have quoted already in John chapter 8 verse 32, we learn that truth is liberating. It is the message that we hear and receive that can set each and every one of us Free. In John chapter 14, verse 6, we learn that truth is the only path to God. Nobody can get to God unless they go through Jesus Christ. We learn in John chapter 17, verse 17, that truth sanctifies. The only thing that can make us clean, that can make us holy, is the word of Almighty God. In John chapter 8, verse 38, we learn that truth can be defined and truth can be identified. Amen. And then we also learn in 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, that truth can be known, truth can be understood, and if we know and understand the truth and obey that truth, it will lead us to life everlasting. Amen. Now, in our scriptural text, Going back to Isaiah chapter 30, verses 8 through 11, we learn some additional facts about truth. We learn in that text that truth is absolute and not relative. That means that truth is truth regardless of everything going around the truth. For example, if I turn to Brother Shannon and I say, Brother Shannon, 
is a good elder, then I am speaking the truth. But if I say Brother Shannon is a good elder compared to Brother Hank, see, that's relative. That doesn't even speak to whether or not he's a good elder or not. It just says, compared to Brother Hank, he's a good elder. You know, it reminds me, now granted, they're both good elders. That's absolute (laughs) truth. Okay? Amen. Thank you. I got one amen out of 200 people here at this point. Yeah, they're good elders, okay? But the point of, it was just a point of illustration to get us to understand the difference between relative as well as absolute. Maybe if I tell another story, there's a story about this preacher that had come to town to preach for this congregation. And he learned the rumors that uh, these preachers only last about six months in this two brothers in this congregation that gave a lot of money and they were very influential to the community. They were very influential in the church. So when the preacher didn't preach what they wanted preached, they always got rid of the preacher. And so this preacher had a reputation of being no nonsense. And so what happened was, is that one of the brothers died. And so the brother that was left alive came to the preacher and says, now I'm going to allow you to do my brother's eulogy. But when you do his eulogy, I'm going to need for you to tell everybody that my brother is a saint. And so the preacher said, well, I don't think I can do that. He said, well, if you don't do it, then you're going to be without a job. And so the day of the funeral came and the preacher got up. And he stood before everybody as he's giving the eulogy. He said, this man that's laying before you, he said, he's the worst human being I've ever met in my life. He said, this man would take candy from a baby. He would sit there and try to tell people what to do. He thought he was God, but he wasn't God. But compared to his brother, he was a saint. And so we see the difference between absolute and relative. We learn in Isaiah chapter 30 that truth is absolute. It is not relative. We also learn that truth is the opposite of a lie. And then number three in Isaiah chapter 30, we learn that truth is not always a smooth thing. My brothers and sisters, we are living in an age where humanity does not see truth as being absolute. As we evangelize the lost, we We share with them the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and show them expressly from the scriptures and what the scriptures say without an addition, subtraction, or interpretation. And after we do these things, we still hear the unfavorable response of, well, that's your truth. Or based on your experiences, that may be true. And so we live in a world in which truth is not considered to be absolute. It's considered relative. But I want you to know on this morning that truth is not defined by its relationship with other things. I want us to also know this morning that truth needs no crutch for it stands on its own merit. I want you to know this morning that truth does not change. If it was truth 2,000 years ago, it's still truth today. Truth is eternal. That means that truth doesn't die. You can kill the messenger of truth, but truth will still be around. Because truth is truth regardless of what we think. And truth is what we, truth is truth whether we believe it or not. You know, oftentimes people drive around with these bumper stickers that say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. No, I don't believe that. I believe God said it, that settles it whether you believe it or not. Because God's word is God's word and it cannot change for anybody or anything. Now, my brothers and sisters, we are residing in a time in which many have blurred the line between truth and error. Some of our brethren have embraced error because it has some truth when we need to call error what it is, and that is a lie. See, only the devil can line two statements up that are different and convince humanity 
that it is the same thing. See, Jesus says that's what the devil does. In John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus says, you are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father you would do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks it of his own because he is a liar and the father of it. And so if we truly understand what's being said this morning, then we know that worshiping on Saturday is not the same as worshiping on Sunday. We learned that worshiping with mechanical instruments of music in worship is not the same as worshiping without mechanical instruments of music in worship. We learned that a woman in the pulpit is not the same as a man in the pulpit. And we learned that fellowshipping with denominations is not the same as fellowshipping with Christians. The devil will lead you to believe that they are one in the same, but I want you to know this morning that the devil is a liar. In John chapter 14 and the verses 26, the Holy Spirit came to guide the apostles, not in some truth, not in a few truths, but in all truth. Because anything less than all truth is a lie. My friends, we are existing in a period where not hurting people's feelings is more important than saving a person's soul. Hence, don't preach to us what is right. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. That's what the people were saying in Isaiah's day. And don't you know, that's what people are saying today. Now, maybe some of us are struggling with today's title because of the word always. You know, I learned in premarital counseling that whenever we use the words always and never, it's usually in association with a lie. You know, uh, man, Antoine never does what he's supposed to do. Really? Never? (laughs) Never? You know, I'm a good wife. I always submit. Really? Submit always? You know what I'm saying? So always and never seem to be associated with life. So sometimes people may look at this lesson and be like, man, he put always in this. He put never in this. I want to see where he goes with this. But I want us to know this morning that to use the word always suggests that there are times in which truth is smooth. There are times in which truth is smooth. Truth is not always smooth, but there is times in which truth is smooth. Listen to your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and the verses 18. The Bible reads, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So to those that are, to, to those that look at truth being folly, oh, the truth is not smooth to them. But to those of us that are heaven bound, Among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing to one a fragrance from death to death and to the other a fragrance from life to life who is sufficient for these things in other words the same message is perceived two different ways based upon what our final destination is if people got a problem with truth they are hell bound the truth is not smooth to them But to those that are heaven bound, the truth is smooth. And I thought I would say that before people give their critiques after this morning's message. You know, if you got a problem with what's being said today, just know where you're going. And if you agree with what's being said today, you know where you're going. Because again, what does truth mean to you? It's either smooth or it's not smooth. And it has nothing to do with the message. It has to do with the heart receiving the message. So what these verses teach us is that the texture of truth is consistent 
and it's invariable. That means that it doesn't change. Right. It's consistent. Therefore, the texture has nothing to do with truth, but the receiver of truth. Our attitude towards God's word determines whether truth is smooth or harsh. If we are doing what God commands, then the word will be smooth and we, will con and we must continue to hold the line. But if we are not doing God's will, if we are not obeying God's commands, then his word will be harsh and we must make some changes. Unfortunately, people today are like Judah. We want preachers to change the word to fit the man when man is the one who needs to change to fit the word. And so let's go back to our scriptural text as we bring this message to a close this morning. Isaiah chapter 30 and the verses are 8 through 11. Isaiah chapter 30 verses 8 through 11. The Bible reads, and now go write it before them on a tablet and ascribe it in a book that it may be for the time to come as a witness forever. For they are a rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. Leave the way. Turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. And so what should we get out of this message this morning? Number one, stop lying. Amen. Or actually stop rebelling. Stop lying is next. Stop rebelling. Amen. Stop doing things your way. Start doing things God's way. God has told us what to do. And it's hard to kick against the pricks. That's what Jesus told Paul on that Damascus road. And so, my brothers and sisters, we have to stop rebelling against what it is that we read clearly in God's book, the Bible. Number two, we have to stop lying. We got to stop making this book say things that it doesn't say. The reason why denominationalism exists is because you got men and women saying things that this book doesn't say. And then opening up the Bible and saying that the Bible says it when the Bible doesn't say it. We have to stop being like Judah and stop lying. We have to be willing to hear God's word. The reason why so many people are ignorant of sin is because they are unwilling to hear what God has to say. And you know when you know somebody is unwilling? Well, I believe this. Well, I believe that. Let me show it to you in the Bible. I don't need you to show it to me. They're unwilling, unwilling to hear God's instruction. We need to see what God has said. Sometimes it's best to have people read the verses instead of you quoting it to them, reading it to them. Sometimes they have to see it with their own eyes to see what God is saying. We need to preach what is right. But what if people don't like it? You got to preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why? Because the time is coming when men will not endure sound doctrine. And they will heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears that will turn to fables instead of the truth. My brothers and sisters, we have to continue to say the right thing because it's the right thing and it's the right thing to do. We need to rebuke error. There's a lot of people that can't distinguish between truth and error because we don't call error, error. We call it a mistake. We call it a difference of opinion. But no, error is error, truth is truth. And sometimes you have to call it out. You have people worshiping all over this city in churches that God doesn't even recognize. Yes, they may have the right name, but they have the wrong worship. They have the wrong doctrine. They have everything that is wrong, and yet people flock to them because they say, well, the name is right. Or, or they teach the right thing in regards how to get into church. But if, the heres but if the doctrine is heresy and damnable when you're in the church, then it's not going to help you. And, and so you have to call error, error. Not only that, we have to get back on the path if we are off the path. 
If we are off the path, we need to get back on the path. We just can't recognize the fact that we off the path and feel that there's nothing we can do about that. No, if we are off the path, we need to get back on the path. And we need to stay on the path if we are on the path. And so if you're going the right way, yes, there may be times in which you have some bad days. Yes, there may be some times in which you feel like giving up. Yes, there may be some days in which you feel like quitting. But whatever you do, stay on the narrow path. And then finally, we need to learn more about what it means for Jesus to truly be Lord of our lives. You know, there's a lot of people that have the cliches. We know, we know how to sound holy. Too blessed to be stressed. I'm too anointed to be disappointed. Oh yeah, we know the phrases. But that doesn't mean that Jesus is Lord of your life. Yes, we may call him Lord. We may say that he is the captain of our salvation. But if he is steering one ship and you on another ship, then he's a captain, he's just not your captain. And so now it's time for us to understand what it means for Jesus to be Lord of our lives. And that is the fact that he has a truth that can sanctify us. He is the truth that we must go through and be in in order to get to God. And he is the only one on this time side of heaven that can set each and every one of us free. So where do you stand on this morning? We're about to sing a song, and that song is entitled Trust and Obey. We have to do both. It's not enough to just trust what God has to say, but we have to trust and obey, and we already got one coming forward. Amen. All right. <laughs> and so we, we need to trust and obey. My brothers and sisters, When it comes to God and his word, we need to trust him. We need to obey him. It's not enough to hear about what he has to say. We have to do what he says. And when we recognize that we are lost, when we recognize that we're off, when we recognize that we're in slavery to sin, we need to do what that little boy did right now. Don't walk up here all somber. Listen, this is where salvation is. Everybody needs to run to Jesus just like that. Everybody needs to come to the Lord just like that. People need to rejoice knowing that their sins are about to be forgiven and glorify him once their sins has been forgiven. And so you've heard the truth this morning. Do you believe that truth? Do you believe that Jesus has a truth that can sanctify? Jesus is the truth that can get you to glory. Do you believe that Jesus has the truth that can set you free? Then give up sin. Because don't you know it's sin that has us bound. It's sin that's making us unholy. It's sin that's corrupting our souls. It's sin that is breaking us down. It's sin is the reason why some of us are sick. It's sin is the reason why natural disasters happen. Sin is the reason that's turning this world upside down. But let us all give up sin, turn to Jesus, so he can turn the world upside, right side up. That's what we need. We need Jesus. Will you confess him this morning to be the son of the living God? Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, Jesus says, Who of shall confess me before men? Him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. Will you have your sins washed away by submitting to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in that watery grave of baptism? Be baptized because he said so. Meet his blood. Have your sins washed away. Be clean this morning that he may sanctify you by you not only trusting him, 
but obeying him this very morning. And when you come up out the waters of baptism, God will forgive you of your sins. It doesn't matter what you've done. God will forgive you according to Acts 2.38. He will make you a new creature in Christ Jesus according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. He will add you to his church, the only church that you could read about in your Bible, and that church is the church of Christ. Jesus said he was going to build that church in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. He built that church in Acts chapter 2. He purchased that church with his very own blood according to Acts chapter 20, verse 28. He adds the saved to it according to Acts chapter 2, verse 47. And that church bears his name according to Romans chapter 16, verse 16. So why not become a member of a going church for a coming Lord, which does all that God authorizes? The church of Christ is where you need to be. And if you are a Christian on this morning, have you had a strange relationship with truth? Have you had a weak relationship with truth? Do you have a compromising relationship with truth? Then this is your opportunity to come back to the truth, knowing that Jesus is truth. And this truth can set you free. And this truth can sanctify your soul and make you all that God has called you to be this morning. Amen. Will you come repenting of your sins? Will you confess your faults? Will you be an example to those that have separated themselves from God with sin? Will you be courageous and say, I need help. Can you pray for me? And we will pray with you and we will pray for you this morning. So wherever you are, this very day, make a wise-hearted decision while together we stand.